Now let's look at how we can exploit the caches available. Now, it is a fact that a test and set instruction has to necessarily go to memory. When we want to acquire the lock, we have to execute a test and set instruction so that we can atomically make sure that exactly one processor gets the lock. But on the other hand, the guys that don't have the lock could, in fact, exploit the caches in order to wait for the lock. And that's why this particular algorithm that I'm going to describe to you is what is called spin-on read. And the assumption here is that you have a shared memory machine in which the architecture is providing cache coherence. Or in other words, through the system bus or the interconnection network, the hardware is ensuring that the caches are kept coherent. Well, that gives us an idea as to how we can exploit the caches. The waiters, instead of executing a test and set instruction that has to go to memory, they can spin locally on the cached value of the lock. Because when you are spinning on the local cached value of the lock, if that value changes in memory, these guys are going to notice that. That's the principle behind the cache coherence that is implemented in hardware. And so we can exploit that fact in implementing a more efficient way of spinning, which is called spin on read. The idea is that the lock algorithm, the first thing it's going to do is go and do the check on the the memory location to see if it is locked. So this is a, a normal atomic read operation that is being done, not a test and set operation. So if it is not in the cache, you're going to go to memory and bring it in. And once you bring it in, so long as this value doesn't change, we're going to basically looking at the value that is in my cache in order to do the checking. And I'm not going to go to the bus, and therefore I'm not producing any, any contention on the network. And there could be any number of processors waiting on the lock simultaneously. No problem with that because all of them are going to be spinning on the local value of L in the respective caches. And so if there is one processor that's actually doing useful work and it has to go to memory, it's not going to find that to be a problem. No contention on the network from the waiting processors because of this. Now if the one processor that was having the lock eventually releases it, they're going, everybody is going to notice that. And so if I'm waiting for the lock and I've been spinning here locally in my cache, when the, the lock is released, I'll notice that through the cache coherence mechanism, I'll, sp I'll, I'll break out of the spin loop. But immediately I want to check. I want to check if the lock is available by doing this test and set and get it uniquely for myself. So if multiple processes are trying to execute this test and set simultaneously, it's possible that somebody else is going to beat me to the punch, and if that happens, I simply go back and, and, and do the looping on my private copy of L and wait for the guy who beat me to the punch to release the lock eventually so that I can get it. So that's the idea. The idea is you spin locally. When you notice that the lock has been released, you try to do a test and set. If you get lucky, you win. If you lose, you go back and spin again locally. So that's the idea behind spinning on read. The unlock operation, of course, is uh, pretty straightforward. The guy that wants to unlock is simply going to change the memory location to indicate that L is no longer locked. So that's all it has to do. And then, and then uh, the other processes can observe it through the cache coherence mechanism and be able to acquire the lock. But note what happens when the lock is released. When the lock is released, all the processes that are stuck here in the spin loop, they're going to go and try to do this test and set operation at the same time. And we know that test and set has to bypass the cache, and everybody's hitting on the bus, right? Everybody's hitting on the bus, trying to go to memory in order to do this test and set operation. And so that essentially means that in a write invalidate based cache coherence mechanism, it's going to result in order of n square bus transactions for all of these guys to stop chattering on the bus. Because every one of these test and set instruction is going to result in invalidating the caches. And, and as a result, you have an order of n square operation that is going to uh, result when a lock is released, where n is the number of processors that are simultaneously trying to get the lock. And obviously, this is impeding that one guy that got the lock and can actually get some useful work done. And this is clearly disruptive. And earlier, 
one of the things that we said is that we want to avoid or limit the amount of disruption to useful work that can be done by the processor that acquired the lock. 